Hello, welcome. Thanks for coming, everyone. So we're gonna get started. Uh, my name is Ben Fina Radin. Uh, I'm from the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And uh, this session today is part of the open source digital preservation and access stream. Uh, and we are very excited today to share with you a bit about uh, what we've been doing at the museum to uh, build a system for housing our digital collections. Uh, this is a project that's been going on for uh, many, many years, although uh, we've only actually been building the thing itself for the past year. So it's a, it's a really exciting moment right now. And uh, so the way this is going to go today, uh, I'm going to hand things off in a moment to Kara Van Malsen from uh, AV Preserve. And Kara is going to talk a bit about uh, the history of the project and our kind of planning process, how we kind of figured out what we actually needed instead of uh, just kind of shopping around for solutions. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about our process of producing a request for proposals and the kind of different companies we looked at. And then we're actually going to show you the system. Uh, and then we will hear from Dan Galeen from Artifactual Systems. And Dan will be talking about the development methodology that was used uh, in building our system. And that will be it. So with that, I'm going to hand things off to Kara. All right, hi, good afternoon. I'm actually going to try to use a timer. Let's see how that goes. OK, so I'm Kara Van Malsen from AV Preserve. Um, and I'm just going to give you uh, a little bit of the backstory um, to explain how we got from there to here, <laughs> to where we are today. So um, we have a timeline on the screen. Going back to about 2008, and that's around the time that I initially started uh, working with MoMA and uh, Glenn Wharton at the time was a time-based media conservator. Um, <clears throat> they recognized, you know, there was, there was definitely a need for something to better manage the digital collections at MoMA. And these are the fine art and art and architecture collection design collections. So um, as I'll show in a minute, the, the collections were growing at a, at a very rapid pace. And so at the time, we sort of started kind of trying to come up like, what did we actually need to do? So the first thing we really needed to do was develop our business case to present to the management, to the administration, to start to get support internally, to, to kind of define the problem and articulate what the solutions were, what we needed, you know, to better manage the collections. So um, that was really the first step. And I, that's why that timeline slide kind of goes quite a while, because that, that was a slow process and it took, took a good amount of time. But a lot happened in that time period. Um, you can see on this slide <clears throat> a couple of things. The collections at MoMA were growing quite exponentially. Um, the, the, the graph on the upper uh, left-hand side, if it's hard to see in the back, is the time-based media acquisitions at MoMA, starting back from 1970 on the horizontal axis up to 2012. And so you see a big spike um, there, which is you know definitely growth in time-based media coming into the museum. And as Ben just pointed out, it wasn't just that time-based media was increasing, all acquisitions were increasing. So, um, but, but with that came a lot more time-based acquisitions as well. Um, at the same time, there was also an increase in software-based artworks. I'm sure you're, many of you are familiar with MoMA's acquisition of um, um, video games a few years ago and, and the continued development of those types of collections as well. So more complex material, more large data, um, things that were going to need to be digitized, and digitization actually happened in this time frame as well, um, spearheaded by Peter Alexic, who's probably here. Are you here? Um, He's doing a lot of that digitization work with the video. So what the, our, the conservators needed a way to better manage these materials, to have more automation, to have centralized storage, to have ways you could do processing that weren't so manual and hands-on. You know, this is a lot of data. So how can we do this more elegantly and more um, automated, and so programmatically? So around late 2011 i think it was you know go ahead you guys uh you know the museum said we we get it you know you have our support why don't you start figuring out what it actually is that you need what is the system um that um that you actually want here so we started developing um, a system specification for what what is now called the drmc the digital repository for museum collections um and what would that actually look like so we went through a process um, to, to make this happen, which 
began with involving all the stakeholders. So we gathered relevant stakeholding groups around the museum, conservation, AV, IT, um, the group that manages the collections management database, um, more. Um, got all those people together. <clears throat> In total, we had about five departments and 13 interviewees and started to understand what their problems were, what their challenges were, what their visions and goals were for a solution. So we started collecting all of that data and out of that we began to, uh, it would enable us to articulate some requirements and use cases. And so system requirements are sort of like very granular functionality that we needed to have, like very, very, very specific as much as possible. Um, and use cases are sort of stories or narratives that illustrate how a user would actually use the system to accomplish a task. And it really is a way to communicate to um, either to um, developers who might be building a system for to meet these needs or to evaluate existing technologies that might be in the marketplace to see if they'll meet your needs. So it's a good way of expressing what those needs actually are um, from the perspective of, those, of the user. So we ended up with 55 functional requirements. This is a little bit higher level. Um, you could definitely get down in the weeds and go much, much, much lower, but at the time, that's, that's, that was serving the needs quite well. We had 22 use cases, which is quite a lot, illustrating everything from how do we create SIPs, which is a term coming from the OAIS standard for submission information package, um, doing integrity checking, fixity checks on the files to make sure there's no corruption in the data, um, things like search and browse, what should that look like or how should that interaction be? Um, so, you know, somebody says like, oh, we want the system to do search, you know, we want fast food search. Well, what does that mean? Like, what do you actually want that interaction to look like? And that's what these use cases try to spell out in a little bit more detail. At the same time, we also wanted to make sure that the um, community at large was, um, that we were able to benefit from some of the expertise out there, especially those groups um, that had been working with complex media and digital preservation environments for some time. So we engaged uh, six external advisors for a meeting uh, and some of those folks are actually in the room. We have Howard Besser, who's in the back, Hannah Frost was there, um, and Ben was there. And at the time, uh, Ben was at Rhizome at the New Museum, so it was very serendipitous, actually, that he uh, attended that, that, um, that meeting. So, in late to mid-2012, we, we finalized the specification based on the feedback from the experts. They said, yep, looks pretty good, okay. All right, now what? Okay, so um, what we, uh, oh, sorry, I'm a little behind on my slide. So around this time, now mid-2012 to 2013, a lot happened in the interim. And one great thing is when you have a specification, you can sort of start to understand what you need to fill um, and think about ways that that might be accomplished. It might not be that we need to build a giant software System. We don't. It, it, maybe there are existing elements of this that could be filled in other ways. What we knew was we have the TMS collection management system and the DAM, um, which is used for providing access to like images of artworks, like photographs of a vase. Kind of, you know, that's that's the purpose the DAM was, was serving. So we were actually avail able to use that spec to evaluate those existing applications within the museum's environment and see if they could meet the needs at all. And what we found was we really had a lot of gaps in those systems and they weren't going to meet the, the requirements um, for the digital collections. So we knew we needed storage, some kind of set of services to do processing. There definitely needed to be a database component and an application layer to allow the users to interact um, with all those things. So during this time period, the storage was acquired, dedicated conservation storage. Um, they added a team member, which is Ben, so that was actually a huge part of, the, of making this successful. And this sort of services bubble got filled by an application called Archivematica, which is an open source application that actually is developed by Artifactual Systems, uh, which, which Dan represents, but um, that's another story. So while those components were in place, there was still this sort of missing piece, and it's just this man management application layer. Like, what is the layer that's going to allow the Con conservators to, to manage the collections and you know understand the collections well and have that automation and you know really to be able to do some analytics reporting and things like that. So in mid 2013, 
Uh, it was decided that a request for proposals should be issued for uh, software development for this management application layer. So what we did was we kind of did that same process, went back to our requirements, use cases, sort of refactored and refined them. Um, it had been in a, a year later. Um, we had a lot more existing components in house now at the museum, so we were able to kind of look at that and say, okay, what do we need? What's missing? And, and try to spell it out. So we in, issued an RFP that kind of laid out all these components, and and that went out in April of 2013. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Ben to continue the story of, of how the RFP process went and then, uh, yeah, take it from there. Thank you, Kara. Um, so around this time, we, we released this RFP. We sent it to five different firms, which actually is a pretty small number. Um, and interestingly enough, two firms dropped out after they actually read the, the RFP and requirements. Um, and I think that actually speaks volumes to kind of what we were seeking to do here. It was seen by uh, some pretty serious firms, uh, software development firms, as very risky. Uh, you know, there were some requirements that while they were defined, saying we need to be able to do this, how that could be done was very ill-defined uh, because we wanted to have a methodology in, in building the system that was iterative and sort of uh, experimental. Uh, we wanted to learn as we were building. And some of these firms felt that that was risky because it could mean going over budget or not being able to actually finish the project and things like that. Uh, so of the three firms, um, that did uh, make it through to actually saying, yes, now that we know what you're doing, we want to work with you. Um, there were th sort of three different sizes. There was a very, very large vendor with uh, thousands of developers, offshore locations, you know, 24 hour phone support, uh, and uh, a firm that MoMA had worked with uh, extensively in the past and still does today for other projects. Uh, there was a medium-sized vendor who had uh, also great experience with uh, museums, and uh, they were about a team of 30 to 40 people, and then there was a very small team, and that was Artifactual Systems. Uh, so when we were, the, the vetting process for these RFPs, it was really kind of designed not just to uh, you know, see their portfolio of past projects, but we had some small deliverables that were really designed to see a like what is the quality of your product specifically with what we want to do, but also what is it like to work with you, uh, and with these kind of ill-defined kind of digital preservation concepts, um, how how do you wrangle those? Uh, and what we found was that uh, the other two firms where they really, really fell short was in domain expertise. Uh, Artifactual Systems was unique in the sense that. You know, they're composed of developers, trained archivists, information scientists, uh, systems engineers, like a really unique team that, you know, general purpose software development companies simply don't have. Uh, and we felt that if your team does not include the kind of deep knowledge that the client has internally, if that firm doesn't have that, it's just not going to work. Uh, so we, uh, and it was interesting in the sense that Artifactual Systems represented uh, a vendor that MoMA was not used to dealing with as an institution. You know, they were small, they were young, and um, what we were seeking to do was build something new, a new application from scratch, whereas uh, in the past Artifactual had focused on their two core products, Archivematica and a system called Atom. Uh, so we did see this as a big gamble, um, but simply put, the, uh, the do domain expertise was invaluable. So. So the, uh, the relationship began between the very, very big institution and uh, the perhaps the uh, suspicious institution <laughs> of um, and the the small vendor. Uh, so now I'm going to hand things over to. Oh wait, no, no, no. I'm sorry. We're doing things differently this time. I'm not handing things over to Dan. Uh, we're actually going to show you what we built. Uh, so we're going to demo the system now and. Uh, after that, we're going to uh, hear from Dan in terms of uh, methodology. So what we built and how we built it. Uh, so the first thing I want to show is, uh, and I'm sorry if you can't see this in the back. Uh, we're going to post this online later. Uh, but the first thing I want to show is just basic search and browse functionality. 
so this is when the first thing that uh, the user sees when they log into the DRMC was that dashboard you saw. But this is the search and browse page. Uh, as you can see, our unit of information is the artwork. Uh, this is not an archival collection. Each of these results listed you see is an individual artwork. And on the left-hand side here, we have various facets that are kind of a mashup of data pulled in from our collections management system and the really detailed metadata that Archivematica produces. So the, this is really the point of this system. You know, Archivematica produces these great archival information packages with very rich metadata, but that's just an XML in a bag. Uh, and that's not very useful in terms of search and browse and managing collections. Um, so here you're just seeing uh, a demonstration of the facets. I, I limited results to uh, only show artworks that were uh, in the media and performance art curatorial department. Now we're viewing works that were created uh, in the 70s from that department. So this is all, again, just, uh, this is not metadata that Archimatica is producing. It's, it's all coming from TMS. And that was a really fundamental uh, design decision in building the system. We didn't want to reinvent any wheels internally at MoMA. We wanted to work with existing systems and maintain TMS, uh, which is our collections management system, as the system of record for the collections. Um, so here you're seeing uh, it's works from the same curatorial department based on when they were uh, collected. And it's, the interface is pretty snappy. It's very fast. We're using uh, AngularJS for all of the, the front end. So it's, it's very responsive. And um, Twitter bootstrap for all of the uh, basic uh, architecture of the pages. So now we're going to show you what the page actually looks like for an artwork. So we're going to look at uh, Boomerang by Richard Serra and Nancy Holt. So the artwork record has a few basic components. Uh, the title, year, and artist, main image, and the core metadata, sort of the tombstone metadata, the, basically what you would see on the wall text. That's all pulled in from TMS. And then what we have here is called the, the context browser. That's what we're calling it. Uh, basically, in TMS, if you're familiar with it, artworks have components. A component, in this case, is a 3 quarter inch umatic tape. Uh, there's several of those, and there's a two-inch quad tape. There are also uh, components in TMS for the digital video files. So we pull those in from TMS, and we correlate those with the archival information packages. And this interface is used for cataloging and expressing the complex relationships between these components. For instance, the fact that this specific digital file was created from this specific tape is a very, very important distinction, of course, to know and to have and to visualize. And so this is also the interface to the actual digital objects themselves. Uh, on the right-hand side is the file listing. So as one is clicking through this graph and exploring the metadata associated with these components, uh, the files associated with those components is listed. Uh, clicking a file gives you a basic uh, digital object viewer if it's something that is uh, you know, playable or viewable in a web browser. Um, and on the right-hand side here, we have the characterization metadata. So in our case, we've chosen to use media info for our characterization of digital video. But of course, if you are familiar with Archivematica, that's a decision you can make for yourselves. You can add whatever tool you would like for characterization. Uh, so. Next, what we are, oh, and here I'm just showing also you can download the original master. So, of course, you're watching a derivative when that was playing in that player, uh, and that derivative is produced by Archivematica. So, you know, Archivematica generates these archival packages, makes uh, derivatives for viewing and access, um, obviously not for exhibition purposes. Uh, they're not of that level of quality, um, but just for basic reference. Um, but if, let's say, one wanted to make uh, a ProRes file for exhibition, you would download the master and uh, you know, produce that locally. At least that's our current workflow. Uh, and as you saw, when you download original files, uh, the full quality masters, we require users to actually say why they're downloading something. So we have a permanent record of who has ever downloaded masters, when, and why. Um, 
So next, we actually, um, something that we find we need to do quite often is compare the characteristics of two given files. Let's say the artist gave us two files, they look exactly the same and we're not really sure why. Um, so comparing the media info output is one really quick way to really see what the difference is. Uh, so we can multi-select two files here <clears throat> and it just shows the characterization for those two files side by side. In this case, we're doing it with still uh, raster images, with TIFF images. And just showing some of the functionality of the digital object viewer. If there are multiple files, you can cycle through them. So to, now that we've shown the characterization to go back to the search and browse, um, as I said, we are indexing that characterization metadata, all of this information produced by Archivematica. So as you can see, there are facets for uh, format, video codecs, audio codecs, chroma subsampling, all of that stuff that media info produces you can use when you are searching and browsing. So if we say, you know, only show me artworks in the Department of Architecture and Design, when you scroll back down to these characteristics facets, the numbers have updated. Uh, so it's not here for reporting purposes, but it is for basic assessment. Uh, it becomes really easy to see in your entire repository if you have something that has, you know, an inferior uh, bit depth or chromosome sampling or sample rate, what have you. Um, but we do also index and provide that same information in a more report-based format. So <clears throat> to go back to the dashboard, the dashboard is uh, built of various widgets. The first widget that we're looking at here is for fixity checks. So uh, we worked with Artifactual Systems to build a basic fixity checker that will iterate over the entire repository and check uh, for uh, fixity at the file level. Uh, we're doing uh, SHA-512. And that widget, here we're just showing uh, the full log for fixity checks. This widget basically reports uh, on ongoing fixity checks uh, and past fixity checks. Here we have recent activity in terms of uh, material that was recently ingested and material that was recently downloaded. Uh, next we have some visualizations. Uh, pie chart showing the various curatorial departments and their representation in the repository. Uh, pie chart of all of the AV codecs in the repository and a pie chart for MIME types. This line graph is illustrating the rate of ingest on a month-to-month -month basis. So it's just showing the fluctuations of activity in terms of how much we're storing. Uh, this is actually a visualization of collection date. So that's the, actually the graph that Kara showed earlier. Of course, it's not complete because we don't have anything in the repository yet. We just finished building it. Um, so that, uh, to be clear, this is all test data. And now, Below here, we have another line graph of ingest activity, but this is, uh, it adds on the values every month. So this does not show month to month fluctuations, but overall trend lines. Um, and, right, and then the, the widget to the right, this is actually, this is a bit, it's a bit odd, but what we decided to do is we wanted to understand, like, are the total, is the amount of storage required for a given artwork kind of trending in any way over the years? Like, are artworks requiring more space? Like, of course they are. You know, we're getting HD video now instead of SD. Um, but what does that really look like? Um, in any case, um, we're now showing reports. We have full reports for ingest activity, download activity, uh, fixity checks, and this one is video characteristics. Um, so it's basically our, characteris our characterization output just in a you know, tabular format. It can be downloaded as a CSV, so if you want to do some uh, more advanced visualizations or analysis on it, you can do that. But it's a, it's a nice basic uh, visual sort of like at a glance thing. Uh, so lastly is user management. So in the upper right hand corner there is my username and specifically at MoMA we've integrated with our you know, user system which is Active Directory at MoMA. And we have four user groups so people can either only uh, view things and not edit any metadata or download any originals. They can just play things in the browser 
or they can play things in the browser and edit metadata. So perhaps a collection specialist that doesn't need access to you know, the actual artwork. They just need to see it and catalog it. Uh, and then the third category is you know, basically full access except for administrative duties. So they, can't manage, they can download everything, they can edit everything, they can view everything, they just can't uh, uh, manage users and things like that and control vocabularies and taxonomies. Um, and then the last group is admins. Uh, so that actually concludes the demo. So now I'm going to pass things over to Dan, and he's going to talk a bit about our development methodology, sort of like how we actually got there. Thanks, Ben. So as Ben and Kara have outlined in this process, a lot of thought went into MoMA's selection process. And I think that it's these initial steps that really made Artifactual want to work with MoMA on this project. Uh, as a firm, Artifactual is most known in the U.S. Uh, for our work with Archivematica, but we also maintain another project called Access to Memory, or Atom, which is an open source web-based description and access platform. We have a skilled and passionate team of archivists and developers. Um, currently, we're about 17, as Ben outlined, and we had seven people working on the DRMC project full-time with contributions from other team members as needed throughout. So one of the original strengths of our proposal to MoMA was in pointing out how much of the functionality that they wanted already existed in Atom. As such, when we originally made our proposal, the idea was to build the DRMC as an extension of Atom. However, we wanted to make sure that the DRMC would remain viable in the long term, regardless of what happened to Atom. As such, we decided that we would abstract all DRMC code from Atom and use it as a sort of back-end dependency that could be swapped out in the future with minimal effort if needed. Uh, ben already outlined some of the technical details, but we're using a MySQL database in the back end. We're using Elasticsearch for our search index, and we're using Twitter Bootstrap and AngularJS in the front end, for those of you who are interested. One of uh, MoMA's requirements in the RFP was that the Agile methodology be used. Now, Agile is a development methodology that focuses on iterative development, short-term sprints of development that are focused on concrete goals and deliverables, which are regularly set in front of the client for review, and then this feedback informing the next round of development. This uh, methodology was new to Artifactual, but one that we saw could be extremely useful for us as a company moving forward. At the same time, we wanted to make sure that before we began development, we had a clear sense of where we were going. Consequently, the way we decided to divide things up was into two phases, planning and development. Phase one, which took place in um, July to September of 2013, was focused just on the initial design. This was followed by a site visit in September 2013 to review this, and then from October to December of 2013, we built an initial prototype to see how those first planning phases would transfer from paper to the screen. Phase two, the active development of the project, took place from January to June of 2014. Following the Agile methodology, we then divided up phase two into a series of sprints. There were five sprints in total. Each were developed with, I believe, six or so concrete deliverables. We planned each of these deliverables to be done in a sprint in about 300 hours, which is what we thought that our small team at the time could handle in a development phase. In addition to this, we also had weekly internal project meetings, and these were also followed up by bi-weekly reports by our project manager, David Yuhaz, and a telecon with Ben to review the process as we move forward. So, if there's one takeaway I can share out of this whole process, it's this. If you want your final deliverable to go beyond just the most minimal requirements, you need to expect to be deeply involved in the process. MoMA understood this from the outset, and I think that this is one of the reasons why they insisted upon the <coughs> Agile methodology. So I don't expect you guys to be able to read this, but what I'd like to show you here is this is just a screenshot of one of the comments on our issue tickets and our development tracking system. The only thing I want to get across here is that in addition to daily discussion among the developers, 
you can also see regular feedback from Ben throughout the process. There's simply no way you're going to be able to hand off a set of requirements to a company, no matter how large or small they are, and expect to get an ideal solution returned to you without involving yourself in the process. Many of the ideas that seem ideal on paper just don't work the same way that you expect when you finally sit a user in front of the screen for the first time. The Agile approach makes allowances for this from the outset so that the application can evolve as it's developed and that feedback can be incorporated as things move forward. So just to outline this process and how we followed it briefly, on the left here you have one of the user stories or use cases that were developed by MoMA uh, in the initial stages. The first thing we did at Artifactual was to transform these into more visual based workflows so we could see what exactly the user would be doing, how the application would respond, and where we felt we actually had to have a look at what the application interface would look like to understand what was going on. From these workflows, we then transformed them into wireframes so that we could see that in action and work out what interface elements were needed. This wireframe on the right shows a user searching for a particular artwork record. These wireframes were then used as the basis of development. So on the right here, you can see the application as it was about two months before code freeze. As you can see, many elements ended up exactly as they were in the wireframe, while other elements had to change as we tested things and found out that they needed adjustment. This is exactly the strength of the Agile methodology, testing, feedback, evolution. In addition to this uh, development methodology, MoMA made sure to invite feedback from the broader community to ensure that we were on the right path with what we were doing. This helped ground all development process in feedback that was broader than just the specific use cases of MoMA's requirements and make sure that we were getting advisement on elements such as architecture, usability, and design. These included an experts meeting in December of 2013 who conducted a suite of usability tests on our initial prototype and a technical advisors meeting, which took place in March of 2014 with experts of the members of the digital preservation community. Further usability testing was also conducted in April of 2014. In all, these sessions were invaluable to both Artifactual and MoMA, and I think really helped us build a much stronger application in the end. Of course, there's always going to be some unforeseen challenges when you finally sit a user down in front of the software for the first time. It's important to remember the complexity of some of the problems that we are trying to solve here. As far as I'm aware, we don't know of another application that's trying to solve these exact use cases. Archivematica and its storage service, as well as some other existing repository software applications, will allow you to create and interact with your AIPs, but there's not much that will allow you to manage the relationships between related AIPs, the software dependencies that are required to preserve and display them, and the artwork components to which they relate. On top of that, as Ben has just shown you in the demo, we were trying to package all this with user-friendly reporting, a widget-based dashboard, and a user-friendly interface. As we move forward in our development, we learn to be much better about avoiding scope creep. This is, part of this is an understanding the difference between de developing a new application from scratch and working on features for an existing one. It's important to understand the first phase of development is all about the architecture, the building blocks, those moving pieces, the refinement and perfection can come later. As such, I think that MoMA became much better about accepting minimal viable product as some of our initial phases and we all learned to keep the focus on the big picture as we move forward. We also began discussing the possibility of future rounds of development, so some of those more finer pieces could be dealt with down the line. One of the last things I want to show you guys here is one of the initial wireframes. This is the wireframe that we submitted with our RFP. You can see, now that you've seen the demo and how things turned out, how far things actually came along along the way. Now, had we developed the application like this initial wireframe, it would have met the use cases of MoMA. And I think that perhaps this is maybe the strongest argument that I have for the Agile methodology, is that ultimately the solution that we hit upon was much more intuitive and user-friendly in the end. We might never have reached that without this cycle of evolution throughout the development phase. 
So finally, I just wanted to mention about going forward, what happens next. A lot of that has to do with all of you. Artifactual is, as a company, committed to open source development and standards-based development. This is what we do with all our projects. However, in this initial development phase, MoMA has built this beautiful new application and we want to work with others with it, but at this point in time, it's been built for MoMA's specific use case. What we'd like to see happen next is to find other development partners, other people in other institutions who are facing similar challenges but with different particular use cases so that we can generalize this application, open up the code, and make this available to the broader community. I'll turn it back over to Ben now. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, so let, like, let's take a minute to step back and like, just what happened here? <laughs> um, so you, know, you had a large institution like MoMA that had a really tough problem. We have huge, huge uh, video, film, software-based collections, just tons of stuff, small media conservation team, hard to manage. So what do we do? Do we go for, you know, a Mellon-funded project, you know, build some new software from scratch, spend $2 million? No. We found some existing open source things that kind of did what we needed and just modified them enough to do what we really needed in the end. And we built kind of like some stuff from scratch. But I guess, you know, the real uh, important thing here is, you know, what is gained by going open source? And I think, you know, that's... A, I mean, there really was, there's a clear financial discrepancy between what this cost us and what this cost, you know, similar, uh, I guess, projects, not to name names, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> I won't name names. Um, but, uh, I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah. I'm, but anyway, so the point is, while this, you know, w was not free as in beer, uh, you know, as the open source parlance goes, uh, it did cost a significant amount of money. You know, software, making software is not free. It takes people and people's time. Um, but it was quite affordable uh, in, in the broad scheme of things. And what we're left with in the end is, you know, this software that is going to be available to anyone. Uh, and, you know, as Dan said, it's not at the moment very useful to everyone because it is very moment specific. It's tied to TMS, it's, uh, it's tied to our user system, there's probably other things that I'm not thinking of, but it can easily be generalized and will become essentially something like Archivematica that you can just download and start using. And of course the software doesn't solve all your problems. You, know, there's, you have to have good storage, you have to have good IT to support the software, you have to have good users that know how to use it, but um, policies, yes, good policies. And, um, you know, one really important thing that we've been doing after having built this is we've been doing kind of a informal audit with ABPS, kind of looking at what we built and then looking at the uh, standard for trusted digital repositories to see, you know, how does this actually line up according to those like really intense standards. Uh, so policies are, that's really our, our big thing right now. We are, we've rolled this out in production and we're starting to put stuff in it for the first time and that's making us realize, oh, what's our policy for this case or that case? Um, I, I think the really exciting thing though is as other institutions with similar problems, uh, you know, sim similar time-based media collections with complex relationships and dependencies and whatnot start to adopt this, uh, you know, it's going to become something bigger than what we imagined. And I think that's really the importance here. You know, we don't want to own this thing. <laughs> we want to see it become something that we, uh, you know, bigger than what we had imagined. Um, so that's it. Uh, we're going to open the floor to questions now. Uh, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, question, yes. Well, 
what we decided to do is roll it out with uh, the recommended uh, values from Dublin Core for expressing relationships, and we know that's not gonna work. Like that's not going to express like the complex relationships of you know AV materials and software-based art. Uh, but we kind of want to take things as they come and sort of, you know, when we encounter a situation where that does not meet our information needs, uh, we can sort of look around then. But I should actually mention that we do have a uh, National Digital Stewardship resident currently at MoMA who is looking specifically at uh, process history and capture metadata standards for AV materials. So how can we express this file was made from this tape uh, in a standards-based way, but also in a user-friendly way? Um, and uh, she will be uh, producing a report of the results of her study uh, probably this spring. Any more questions? Yes? Uh, well, we're, we still use TMS for creating the artwork record, the record of the artwork in our collection, yes, because uh, the creation of those records, at least in you know, our institution, is done by either collection specialists or registrars, but this is a system that's just used by conservators. So we need to kind of view the materials in a very like uh, artwork-centric way, but it's not a place for generating uh, collections metadata. But that being said, in terms of generalizing the software, that's certainly one aspect that could be critical for some institutions where they're saying, well, we don't even have a collections management system. So th this easily could be kind of modified to an extent where this also did serve as your collections management system, and that was where you did that cataloging. Just to add to that a bit, um, access to memory, the uh Access to memory, the uh, underlying software that we sort of built this as a part of. Our approach in that for description and access is template based. So <coughs> we do have templates for standards such as the uh, ICA standards. We have all the ICA standards. We have a MODS template. We have a DAX template. Um, so porting these over, and it, it manages digital content as well. So porting some of these templates over into the DRMC is definitely a direction that we'd like to go next. Um, we do have a basic Dublin Core template already in the DRMC, which is used for creating supporting technology records. So if there's a dependency, perhaps this artwork requires this specific you know, media platform to be used, and you can create a new record in the DRMC using that. Um, and we'd like to see that adapted and broadened so that you don't necessarily have to use another application such as TMS to create your records. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you touched on that feature, actually, because that's something that I forgot to include in the demo, and it's one of the most important features. So one of the problems we have, of course, is that uh, complex software-based artworks often have dependencies that are external to the work themselves. Like, they need to run in this operating system, or you have to have this codec installed on the computer the video is playing on. Um, and those materials or those dependencies are often not specific to one artwork. They're shared by several, perhaps. Uh, so what we've done is we've created a way, like Dan said, that you can create records for those technologies only in this system, and then those materials are ingested. So you can express a relationship between an artwork and an operating system. Uh, so we're excited to start really create, creating that data because it's going to create a pretty uh, cool set that could be used in a lot of different ways um, besides just you know getting it to work. <laughs> Uh, any more questions? Yeah, Chris? Are other museums actively looking at adopting or adapting this? Uh, well, the, the question was if any other museums are looking at actively adopting or testing this. And um, so MoMA is part of what's called the Matters in Media Art Consortium, which was founded uh, as a result of the uh, Kramlix, these, uh, this private collection, essentially creating this trust to uh, gift uh, a lot of time-based media to these various institutions. And p as part of that, the institutions realized, we don't know how to deal with this stuff. This was years ago now, um, well, 2007. 
in any case, um, so SF MoMA, Tate and MoMA, uh, we all kind of talk very frequently about these things, and you know, we we know that they're interested and they're excited to see it and test it. Um, but the fact is that you know the code's not on GitHub yet because it's it's MoMA specific, and um, you know, unfortunately, it's it's hard for us to justify you know paying for the the development to generalize it for others. It might be selfish, but. <laughs> It's um you know it's a it's a hard decision to make when you have a limited budget. So yes, but they can't test it yet because it's not online yet. Yes, in the front. Do you have any sort of guidelines, or if someone's going to submit a film to you, uh, so far as just specifications that would make your work easier, in putting it in your database? I mean that <coughs> really varies. It depends on what we're talking about. If we're talking about um, digitization, then absolutely. You know, we would provide very, very specific specifications to a vendor uh, who is doing digitization for us. Uh, but if we're talking about material f uh, from an artist, it's a very different scenario. Uh, so in media conservation at MoMA, we kind of have uh, some initial conversations to try and understand how the work was created, so that we can understand. Um, you know, we don't want to collect what we think is like a good archival digital format. We want to collect what is, based on the way the artwork was created, its equivalent of a, of a master file. So we don't want the artist to do any like transcoding or, or normalization on their end that could perhaps alter the work in a very significant way That's a before we even get it. So, uh, and, we're, and we're not doing any normalization for preservation purposes on our end yet. Uh, we're, you know, uh, a policy-based way of saying take any video file that we get and transcode it to this oh. specification. Uh, you know, Archivematica allows you to do that on a really granular level. In fact, not just you know, transcode all video to this. You could say transcode this to this and this to this and this to this. But you know, we're kind of waiting, I guess, to get stuff in our system first. And uh, we can always re-ingest if we need to normalize for preservation at a later date. But we feel that there are significant transformations that happen during transcodes for normalization that it's, we have a lot of research to do before we can do that on a policy-based, like totally repository-wide level. Um, yep, in the back. Yeah, uh, I wish Katie could speak to that. Oh, she's still here. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, can you repeat the question? Uh, well, he was asking uh, about about Star uh, and if there's any. So, well, I guess I get. So, uh, the film department has uh, historically had this database Star, which has been separate from the rest of our collections uh, data. But the, the film department is in the process right now of migrating that data to TMS. Eventually, it will take some time, um, and. We are, I mean, the, the, depart, the, the film department has been, you know, in an interesting position in the museum, but it's always been its, like, kind of its, its own entity in some ways, with its own staff conservators and, you know, doing photochemical. So in some ways, we're only just now really starting to bring film into the fold with the, the digital acquisitions that are coming in and digital intermediates that are being produced. Um, and yeah, that's... There's, yeah, there's a lot more, um, the, the curators are acquiring more digital now and not... 35 millimeter prints and 16 millimeter prints. So we, we envision that we're, we're including that into the DRMC eventually. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's actually um, increased the, the the storage that you foresaw happening. Yeah, uh, it's really fully bringing the film department into the fold has totally changed the landscape. I mean, our collection currently is uh, around 75 terabytes and. Uh, I'm sure you all heard, heard about the, the Warhol digitization project, and that alone is going to uh, add around half a petabyte. Um, and then with the digital intermediates that film is producing, that's an additional like potentially 40 terabytes a year. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a big thing. And we, we didn't mention it here today, but we, we are moving over to a new storage system that is more designed for these massive uh, collections of data. We're moving to like hierarchical storage management where mainly everything is on LTO6, you know, but uh, recently accessed and stored materials are, are on spinning disks. So something that isn't just, you know, 
spinning all the data on disk currently, because the fact is that these things go into storage and they might not be touched for another 50 years. It's really you know, based on uh, curatorial programming. Uh, any more questions? <coughs> Going once, going twice, great, thank you.